Well, good morning, and we want to welcome you to the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium webinar. My name is Carl Lissick, Director with Drive Clean Indiana, and the Drive Clean Indiana team will be acting as your host and administrative sponsor for this and all upcoming Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium events. We have a great webinar today and some wonderful news to share. Let's just review the agenda today. We'll be focusing on the success that we've had with the implementation of cleaner fuels, specifically propane in Indiana. So uh, just to review our agenda, uh, we're going to have a an update from US EPA. Uh, Ms. Sue Harrison, Director of Transportation of Mich Michigan City Area Community Schools will speak. And Kate Gaziano, Director of Regulatory Affairs and Associate General Counsel from the National Propane Gas Association will also be on. So uh, a little housekeeping, uh, please ensure you're muted throughout the meeting. Uh, we will begin everyone in the mute mode without cameras, but we'll Open it up during the question and answer time. You will be able to type in any of your questions and we'll get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, we will provide you with an email answer. Today's presentation will be about 30 to 45 minutes followed by a Q&A as well as a short survey. We would ask all of our participants to take their short survey. All additional questions can be emailed to info at drivecleanindiana.org. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the Drive Clean Indiana website. All of the upcoming announcements, including events, grants, projects, and pertinent information will be on our website. If you have any questions, please feel free to call us for further clarification at 219-644-3690. So the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium is a collaboration of federal, state, and local agencies, and concerned citizens, along with communities, nonprofit organizations, and private companies, all working together to make a visible difference in our communities by reducing exposure to emissions from school bus, diesel engines, and equipment. Our goal also is to highlight the great projects and technologies that are being implemented in our state and provide you with resources that will assist you in learning about these new technologies, health concerns, peer-to-peer -peer interaction, overviews and demonstrations of these technologies, as well as best management practices. We want to understand what information you would like to learn about, and we will create upcoming webinar webinars based on feedback we receive from you. Our goal also is very selfish. We want all of our schools applying for the upcoming funding opportunities that will reduce barriers to the transition to cleaner school bus technology. So this is you, your, and our consortium created for clean Indiana school buses. So our goal is to be your one-stop shop for everything school buses in the state of Indiana. With that being said, our Drive Clean Indiana team is here to answer and be of service to you and your schools, and we look forward to working with all of you. I would like now to introduce Mr. Carter Granberg, who will overview the US EPA Clean School Bus Program. Carter? Actually, I think, uh... It's going to be me, Tony Mata. Right. Hey, Tony. Going over uh, yeah, no, no problem. I, I work with Carter, and Carter is on. And I do want to indicate that Carter Cranberg is the the lead from my office, the EPA Region Five office here in wonderful Chicago. Um, and he he normally would be giving this presentation, but he was on travel last week, and so I I just am stepping in to to do this. But um, he is on, and uh, he does lead the effort for Indiana uh, for for EPA. And so he's a very personable guy um, and, you know, definitely reach out to him uh, if you do have any questions about rebates. Um, as you're going to see, as I'm going to go through this overview, during the grant program, we can't specifically answer any questions about the grant program itself. We're going to punt you to headquarters, um, but we can answer any general funding questions like timeframes, things like that. Um, happy to always be around to, to do that. So um, thank you for letting us speak today. Uh, I wanted to talk about our clean school bus funding just to give folks um, a little bit of an overview. Again, it's $5 billion over five years. And last year, EPA outlaid $1 billion for rebates. Um, that program closed in October and we awarded a bunch of uh, rebates around the country. And we learned a lot about that program and some things that were great and some things that were not so great. Um, through these listening sessions that we had, we have a lot of stakeholder meetings like this one today, um, where you, again, you can provide Carter and myself feedback on the program as well. We take that to headquarters. Uh, we heard some things that the rebate program didn't totally address all the issues that folks have across the country. Uh, specifically, you know, the, the limit of 25 buses uh, kind of limited some larger schools who wanted to make a bigger dent in their, you know, 
uh, EV footprint and put more buses in there. Um, some scrappage issues too, where districts didn't necessarily own buses to be able to scrap or sell, you know, as, as per the conditions of the of the program. And then also there were a lot of issues about prioritization, especially in our region, um, you know, because we have the Chicago area, which is one of the largest cities in our, it's Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And so Chicago is one of the largest cities there and they were not on the priority list. And that was a problem for folks. So we heard these lessons. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, there's a grant program. Last year was a rebate program. Uh, t this year in 2023, there will be a rebate program in the fall, um, but there are two programs now. Instead of last year, the billion dollars just going to the rebates, this grant program that is open right now through August is for $400 million. And as you're going to see, there are differences. Next slide, please. The rebate program will open up in the fall. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's just like last year, those rebates are very simple. You go online, it's a three-page application process. Two of the three pages are already filled out by, by nature of you having your SAM.gov information up to date. So most of it's already filled out. It's a random number and your school gets assigned a random number, puts you in a line. And then the application process kind of goes down that line, picking priority schools first. And then it goes back down and goes and picks non-priority schools if there's money um, left. And then the application period isn't open as long. This grant program that opened on April 24th is open until August 22nd. So it's gonna be open for four months. However, as you're gonna see, it's it's not this, it's not for everybody, okay? There's gonna be a 15 page maximum, but usually people fill out all the pages. So there's gonna be a 15 page application process. You're gonna need like a budget table. You're gonna need fleet information in an Excel sheet that's gonna be attached to that. There are federal forms like your 424, 424A budget forms, um, you know, Instead of being assigned a random number, your application is going to get a score of up to 120 points. And there is in the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, it's like an instruction book on how to get all those points and how to fill out that application. So it's not just a thing where you go online and it's mostly filled out for you. You have to put in some time to fill out a basically 15 page application that has a budget, has a timeline, tells the story of what you're going to do, how it fits into a larger, you know, school push for either cleaner air or sustainability or both. Um, and, and again, this, this is gonna be open for four months instead of usually like three months. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna get right into the grant program that is currently open. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm gonna start with some timelines. Again, this is open on April 24th. And at the um, sort of, well, the third one down, it closes on August 22nd. So it's gonna be open for four months. There's a webinar tomorrow, and there's gonna be a link that you can click on here that'll take you to the registration for that webinar. So I can't answer any questions. I'm gonna reiterate this several times. If you ask me personally, I'm gonna punt you to headquarters. But this webinar that's gonna to happen tomorrow, you can ask them questions because it will be headquarters giving that webinar. So. Um, what we do recommend is that you send an email to Clean School Bus Headquarters, and by August 9th will be the last date that you can send an email with a question. Um, you will get an email response. There's also that response and the question will go into a Q&A document, and that's the thing. It's The final date is August 9th because they'll update it one more time, and then that Q&A document will just kind of, it'll be its last update. You can see all those questions. Um, August 22nd is the close date. This is gonna take a while for us to score. So we are looking um, between November to January to select and notify these schools that, hey, we're probably, or these applicants that, hey, we're gonna, we're probably gonna give you funding. And we anticipate awarding these February to March of next year. So this is a longer, a longer process. Um, next slide, please. Now, here's what I was saying. This is not for everybody. So there's $400 million in the grant program and there's two ways to apply. So if you're a school district yourself and it's an eligible entities, you can see there it's basically school districts or, or you know, the local government that is responsible for maintaining that school district and the buses. If you wanna apply yourself, you can apply for a minimum of 15 buses up to 50 buses. So it's not like we just want one. It's like we want a minimum of 15 for your, so we're looking at larger school districts with this funding as opposed to the rebates being, uh, you know, like a choose your own adventure of how many buses you wanna get. Like this is more like, again, 
getting a pretty large cohort of buses 15 to 50 at one time. Um, and then there's a second way to apply and uh, there are third party eligible entities. And so they're nonprofit school transportation associations, eligible contractors that include OEMs, dealers and private bus fleets. So um, those eligible third parties can apply at least four schools. So if you have a third party that's working with your school and at least three others, you can have, you know, there's no minute, there's no maximum. So you can have, you know, in theory, every school in Indiana can apply under one applicant if you guys were all that organized, um, but, but at least four. So then the minimum of a third party applicant on behalf of multiple schools would be minimum of 25 up to 100 school buses. So these are large requests. Um, and what we're hoping we're going to see here is targeting small rural tribal low, low income beneficiaries that may benefit from third party support. So basically schools that, you know, don't have the resources to be able to spend time filling out a 15 page application and all those other forms. Um, you know, another difference between grants and rebates with the rebate, you know, you provide the the titles of the old buses and that you know your your purchase request forms your invoices for the new buses and like you know either documentation of sale or scrappage of your old buses so you're just providing the documents right but you're gonna have to do that in addition to filling out all those forms in addition to quarterly reports and a final report with the grant program so it again it's it's more involved uh, next slide please there are some tweaks um, to the prioritization criteria for the grants program. We don't know how the rebate program will shake out. We anticipate it'll look very similar to last year. Um, I just wanna point out that the legislation, the infrastructure law that gives us this funding tells us that we need to prioritize high need school districts and low income areas, rural schools, tribal schools. And so you can see that um, in those sort of four categories, like the bottom two are, are tribal related. There are tweaks from last year and I put them in bold. So uh, the SAPI data that you can see, the small area income and poverty data, there's a link that you will see. Um, I will occur. And, uh, and there, there's, last year we used 2020 data and this year we're looking at 2021 SAPI data. So if your school district has 20% or more students in that SAPI model um, showing poverty level or higher, um, and just to give you a little example, Chicago was a sticky point because they were 19.99% in 2020, data, but now they're at 21%. So um, they, that does put them into the prioritization. Those have changed from last year a little bit. Um, there's another change too, that if you have a large school with 35,000 students or more, or if there are 45 public schools in your school districts so with a large district, and you don't meet that 20% threshold, you can apply on behalf of a subset of those schools that do meet that threshold. But if you do do that, and you can make a case by case to EPA through your application that, hey, we do have significant in need students that are 20% or more, um, the expectation will be though, if you apply for that subset, that those buses that you'll get will be routed just for that subset of schools. Like you can't send them out to the, you know, ritzy schools and like the more well-off ones, it's gotta be to those in-need schools. There's a change to the rural um, um, designation. So for the rebates, there's these National Center for Education Statistics codes, locale codes. So it's like you're in an urban area, you're in a rural area. Um, for, for the rebate program last year, and we don't know how the rebate program will shake out this year, but for last year, it was 42 rural uh, distant and 43 rural remote. So the rural distant was five to 25 miles away from a metropolitan area. But those are not on the menu of prioritization this time around. It's only the rural remote schools, the ones that are the school districts that are 25 miles or more from, uh, from an urban area. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I was saying just before this opened that in Carter, who's on here, he's also a data whiz and he's a great guy uh, with, with numbers and images. And so he put together, this is a projected map. Um, headquarters is bringing an actual, like from the horse's mouth, like from headquarters map and putting that online. But this is our kind of like best guesstimate of the, you know, above 20% safety schools, those 43 rural uh, distant schools, and then the um, the tribal schools, and also schools with 35,000 or more um, students in the population, which we think we got most of them. So if you see this map, and if you're familiar with last year's map, 
Um, there were more counties filled in in Indiana and all of our states, basically. Like when you start getting to northern, like the northern areas of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, you can see there's more rural, western Minnesota, you know, but we don't, our, we're on the eastern end of the Mississippi, you know, it's, it's a more compact portion of the United States. And so, you know, that 42 um, is gone. And so it's only those school districts that are very far away from urban areas that are in that prior prioritization. And there's a link there that you can click on that'll give you the actual, here's the school name, where they're at, um, you know, the county they're in and stuff like that. So you can see which schools those are to correspond with those um, images. Next slide, please. So what you need to know, all that said, um, really with the brass tax is if you are thinking of applying for any of the funding for the rebates later in the fall, which are easier to do, which are, you know, one up from one to 25 buses, everybody who wants to apply for funding should go on sam.gov right now after this call and make sure that you're registered and that your information is up to date and you have to renew every year make sure you're renewed because it's a long process it gets jammed up with people across the country trying to get on it's not an epa thing it's a, it's a federal government webpage so all the government agencies that are giving out money use this webpage so you have to be on that if you're if you're thinking of applying for the grants so this program that's open right now, um, and you need the SAM, but then you also need to register with grants.gov because grants.gov is, again, another federal web page, but you, that's where you're going to go and submit all those documents I was talking about, like that huge 15-page application stuff. It's got to be through grants.gov. Next slide, please. Um, and, and again, like I said, we cannot answer questions that I'm sure that you all have, but please email them to cleanschoolbus at epa.gov. And if you put clean school bus NOFO, the notice of funding opportunity question in the subject line, someone will respond to you pretty quickly. Um, there's another link you can click on where you'll see this Q&A document that's out there. Um, and the last day, again, to submit questions is August 9th. And I will say there's one more thing that I did not mention in these slides, and is that Carter and I want to do some outreach and get the word out to the school district in Indiana of this grant that's open right now, but also the rebate program in the fall. And, you know, there's no real master list of contact info for school districts. So if there is, you know, if there's an entity on this on this webinar right now who is, you know, maybe a, um, you know, like a state bureau of education or somebody who can point us to where, you know, we can find contact info for Indiana school districts. That would be very helpful for us to help Carl and others get the word out. And, um, you know, we also want to be able to directly email folks information and funding requests and stuff. It's helpful to get it from multiple sources because you might ignore something that you see all the time, you know. But we just we want to make sure that we do get that word out. So, it, you know, that's an ask. If you can email myself or email Carter, uh, definitely Carter. Um, let us know where we can find that information because that's something we are kind of looking for. So thank you very much for letting me speak. I think I went over time, but um, again, that's that's all the info we have right now on this grant opportunity and stay tuned for the rebates. In the um, thank you, Tony. Um, just, just to let you know, Tony, we do have that list uh, from the Department of Education and just for, oh, awesome. uh, yeah, so we have that, we will uh, share that with you. And then also, um, um, I, I know that Mike Larocco uh, from the Department of Education is uh, also on the call, um, but he, he would be our uh, person here in the state with that will help us with that. Um, also, awesome. just the listeners, uh, we will be putting in a grant application on behalf of the Indiana Clean School Bus Coalition. So if you're interested in partnering with, uh, with Drive Clean Indiana and the Indiana Clean School Bus Coalition, please uh, reach out to us and we'd be happy to include you in our grant application, but a lot more to come. So um, moving forward, thank you, Tony, for that uh, great presentation. And I'd like to introduce Ms. Sue Harrison. She's the Director of Transportation at Michigan City Area Community Schools. Sue? Uh, good morning, everyone. I just, I'm going to, I just going to go through some quick things so you guys understand the background of myself and uh, Michigan City Area Schools. Can we go to the next slide, please? I, uh, I've i been the director of transportation here since January of 2012. Prior to that, I had 24 years of uh, law enforcement experience in Michigan City Police Department, retired as a lieutenant there. So obviously taking this job, I had absolutely no knowledge of fleet buses especially. And uh, my need for understanding this fleet better, I started going to a lot of trainings and 
I wanted to look into cleaner fuel, um, better for the environment, because this district is extremely interested in anything environmentally friendly. And um, so that's what I did. And that's how I met um, Carl Lisek and, and Ryan Lisek. And they've kind of walked me through a lot of this. I've learned a lot from both of them. Uh, next slide, please. So the background of Michigan City uh, area schools were on the shores of Lake Michigan, the tourist community, we double in size in the summer, 5,500 students, and we bus over 4,400. Next slide. Our, our district is made up, we have, we have uh, 12 schools all together. We have a high school in A.K. Smith. It's a trade school, career center, two middle schools, eight elementary schools, and we cover 120 square miles, and the, it's between two counties of the Fort Ann border. So we run about 42 secondary routes and 39 elementaries um, plus pre-K. Uh, we cover over 2,400 miles a day. Also any of our McKinney Vento fosters in other counties. Our district and community, like I said, um, Michigan City Area Schools is, we are extremely uh, interested in, in making this environment so much better here in Michigan City and the community is as well. But what we what I did, what we've done to get them on board with the propane, we I've done a lot of media blitz. We've had um, on social media, we've done live radio shows, newspapers, any other outlets uh, that can get the word out. We've done job fairs, back to school rallies. We've even done the touch uh, a truck where we've sent these propane buses out so that people can see them um, and up close and ask any questions they want community wise. We've been really touting this. We've had them in parades. Um, anything to get a positive feedback from the propane. And we and it gets our school board as well on board. Next slide. And just to show you some of the things that the school system has done, which has helped us also to keep the community on board and to get the administration on board. We've got um, a lot of environmental programs. Our middle school at Krieger has uh, won many national and state awards we there's a lot of education and community service projects that michigan city area schools does the other thing slide the next slide solar energy we've become one of the uh we've we've done so well with those what we did was in march of 2018 now we were we became one of the largest renewable energy projects in the school district um we installed the solar panels you see there um, in seven of our school facilities, along with LED lighting. You can just skip to the that slide, the next one now. All right, and so now what research and continued training to learn about our fleets? How, how did this pay off for us? Uh, well, like I said, I met Carl and Ryan as I was attending some trainings and conferences that they had put on um, with South Shore Clean Cities at the time now, Drive Clean Indiana. Our, my primary reason we'd been so successful in this program was just learning and getting to understand propane and being able to get out there, like I said. We also, I, I met Co-Alliance, talked to them at these trainings that we attended, um, learned a lot more about propane and understanding so that I could bring it back to the district. We are also given advice on infrastructures, facilities, I, just the interacting with people that were already involved in this was probably the best thing we could have done. And like I said, um, just learning from people that had already been doing this. Next slide. How did, how did we get where we are today? Like I said, we partnered with um, Drive Clean Indiana in April of 2019. I've been working with Ryan Lisek on these grants and we've been extremely successful, mostly due to him. Um, our first round was in August of 2019. We were awarded 207,000, over 207,000 for eight propane buses. That was the beginning of our venture. We got those buses uh, in January of 2020, and we did not get them on the road for almost a year because of COVID. So we, they've kind of sat, people were excited, our drivers were excited, and um, did not get to get those out until the following school year. Then we were awarded round two um, in August of 2020, and I ordered eight more. The round three, we also were awarded more, 
uh, 200, over 210,000 for seven propane buses. And COVID had really kind of stalled us on that because what had happened was it was taking forever to get these buses. And uh, the demand was high, um, production was down because of COVID. So the price of these went up. So we ended up having to amend um, that grant in November, 2022 to uh, get only six propane buses, which obviously disappointed, but at least we got six. So I w understand that also. I mean, if you get to the point, there's an issue like ours with our uh, school replacement, school bus replacement fund, we couldn't go above what we'd already said that we would. So that's why we had to go down to six. Now we applied for the EPA. We were awarded that in October of 2022, 180,000. I'm waiting on those buses now. And right now, when we begin school in August of 2023, we will have 28 propane buses, nine gas and 28 diesel. But when we started this, we were at 61 diesel and nine gas. The outpouring of support from the community has been great. The bus is quieter, obviously the low emission. Um, next slide. Just to go over a couple other things with this, we've gone through Bluebird. Um, we were we, for every single one of these bids, uh, they've been awarded the uh, the bid for those buses. Co-Alliance is our pro propane supplier, and when we had to do the infrastructure, our Oscar Larson was the ones that came in to install uh, all of the stuff we needed for the infrastructure. We we went around and got bids from people, talked to lots of vendors. And these were the three that we went for because that was the best option for us. Next slide. This is uh, this is my drivers receiving their first uh, round of propane. They were extremely excited. We went through a lot of training with Bluebird, McAllister, so that they understood the safety of uh, fueling um, and just how the propane bus worked compared to the gas and the diesel. They were taught a lot of, of the safety features um, and they, we, we received a lot of great feedback from these drivers, reference uh, the quiet drive of the vehicle, low emission, overall mechanics of this of the buses. We, we really haven't had any complaints at all. And I really see as the time has gone on, the buses have improved each year uh, I just got, we just put the last ones out on the road and uh, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback on these. My next slide. Now what I want to, my suggestion to anyone that is looking into doing this, probably the only mistake I would say we made that we just weren't thinking, we needed to think bigger picture. And we started out with a thousand a gallon tank, but when we set up the infrastructure, that's all we set it up for. So now that we have increased, we're now at two tanks, which we had to then add to that. I wish we had uh, set up the entire infrastructure to be able to increase. Now we need to increase again. And that whole uh, idea you're seeing here, because the one on the left, the two left pictures are the ones that we started with. The two on the right are where we're at now. And we are going to have to increase now. It's not a problem that I'm overly concerned I'm just happy that we can continue to do it but I would say for anybody else that's thinking about doing it think big picture not small picture because I think you're just gonna hopefully you can continue like we have we've been very successful this with this program I would love to see us also um, change our activity buses to propane as well um, and just continue on with this process next slide so if anybody has any questions, um, best thing I can tell you is please uh, reach out to me, reach out to um, Drive Clean Indiana. You will get all your questions answered. They can guide you in the right direction. I can tell you what has uh, succeeded and what has not and how to get it out to your community also just to get the support that you need because I think we've been extremely successful in that. And, uh, we've been featured on a lot of uh, different social media outlets, which has really helped us. And I think hopefully that the communities around us will start 
jumping on the bandwagon as well to uh, go to propane. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sue. Um, as, as folks are um, looking forward to um, potentially asking questions, get your questions and you can put those in, in the chat and we'll get to those after our next presentation. And uh, I'd like to introduce now Ms. Kate Cazano, uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs and Associate General Counsel for the National Propane Gas Association. Kate, take it away, please. Hi everyone, um, I will keep this presentation short and sweet um, because the other panelists have done such a great job of uh, promoting the program. Um, and then also uh, Sue just uh, talking about how great propane buses are. Um, but my name is Kate Gaziano, I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs at the National Propane Gas Association, which is the National Trade Association uh, for the propane industry. We've got a membership of approximately 2,500 member companies, including 36 affiliated regional associations, uh, representing members in all 50 states. NPGA members include manufacturers and distributors of associated equipment, containers, and appliances, including propane-powered buses, vehicles, and producers of propane as a clean air alternative engine fuel um, that's called autogas that uh, powers these propane buses. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, I'm really not going to linger on this because this is just a um, quick info of the EPA has released this NOFO. There's $400 million um, that there's a webinar tomorrow. Um, so my other great panelists have already covered that. So we can go ahead and uh, move on. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to uh, talk for just a couple minutes about um, propane, uh, propane autogas. About uh, over a million students are transported every day uh, in a propane-powered school bus. There are 14 states uh, with over 500 buses, um, a thousand school districts that have propane auto buses, um, and 22,000 and growing uh, propane auto gas buses on the road. We can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, just looking at a cost, um, diesel and propane buses um, have a very similar cost. Propane buses looking like only about 6,000 more um, and eligible for this funding, uh, whereas obviously diesel buses are not um, and uh, much cleaner, much lower emissions. Yeah, um, and so comparing, um, you know, Similarly situated buses, you've got about 100,000 uh, for a propane bus, uh, whereas the EV buses are much more expensive. Um, at one point, about 290,000. Um, so comparing um, non-diesel type C buses, um, propane buses are actually the most common, um, very close to gas buses and CNG and electric buses, um, far fewer on the road. Um, so just talking about the, some of the benefits of propane auto gas, um, it's very cost effective, um, propane averaging only about 15% of the vehicle cost, EV about 200%. Um, and as an eligible fuel under this grant program, propane is well positioned to help government entities and eligible contractors secure their share of funding to reduce transit emissions, lower the carbon intensity of vehicle fuels, and enhance the safety and resiliency of our transportation system. Uh, propane can improve air quality and advance our public health and equity goals in a cost-effective manner. Um, propane can also be better in rural districts um, where the EV infrastructure is not as great. Um, obviously, we're big supporters of all different kinds of, um, you know, clean buses and electric as part of the picture. Um, but we'd love to see propane be part of the uh, part of the solution and picture as well. And are glad that uh, it's involved in this program. We can go to the next slide. Um, and just talking about the kind of the infrastructure that exists in propane. Um, and auto gas, uh, there are 767 auto gas uh, servicing locations um, and available in 48 states. Um, and the fueling infrastructure, equipment trucks uh, for propane, um, that's about 50,000. For CNG, it's about 400,000. And for electric, um, it's about 800,000. Um, so that's all because uh, my panelists covered uh, so much of what I was planning on talking about, which is great. Um, 
and uh, happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, just uh, a couple questions uh, that we can uh, get started on, and I, I think uh, this is probably for Kate and uh, and Sue. Um, as you talked about the benefits of propane, the air quality benefits, um, what about some of the financial savings that school districts uh, potentially could incur uh, by moving towards propane? I know there's been some incentives uh, from uh, some of the federal tax credits, and again, mo most of the schools are nonprofits, uh, but how they can take advantage of some of those credits. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I well, I will say you know, we're looking into some of the tax credits right now, um, we've kind of been a little slow reacting to that, I will say, but I've just been talking to some advisors right now and, and we are working on that in that regard. But also, like last summer when gas prices and, and fuel prices went up so drastically, we had summer school and we run quite a few buses in the summer. We saved a significant amount because what I ended up doing is just putting all the propane buses that we had out on the road and what a huge savings that ended up for us. Uh, if we had had to run diesel, we'd have been in pretty bad shape for the summer. Thank yeah, you. Really, um, not, you know, not sure I have much to add other than that, you know, uh, uh, propane buses um, and propane fueling infrastructure is eligible for various federal grants. Um, of course, this specifically um, this EPA school bus funding grant, but also um, like the Federal Highway Administration has a um, charging and infrastructure grant for propane auto gas um, right now. So there's there's various federal programs coming about um, to help fund um, for, to, for the federal government to help fund um, fueling infrastructure as well as the buses themselves. Hey, Kate, could you also talk a little bit about, again, as Tony um, pointed out, about some of the rural uh, priority school districts, specifically in Indiana, some of the benefits of propane uh, with, with some of these rural areas in our state? Sure. Um, I mean, propane um, is often a better off-grid option um, and, you know, has the ability to operate off-grid. You can have a, um, you know, your there's not as frequent, you know, with an electric vehicle, you need to plug it in every night or every, you know, couple of nights or whatever. Um, whereas propane vehicles um, don't need to be fueled or recharge, you know, or recharged as often. Um, and so that's a really great solution in rural communities. Um, they're also not as heavy um, as electric vehicles. Um, and so in, um, you know, where the roads may not be as um, well paved or steeper or whatever. Um, I know we met with some folks um, in West Virginia um, who in a rural district who were concerned about the weight of electric buses. And so that's um, another benefit propane buses have. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just wanna provide a little balance here um, and just say that, you know, there there's, there's a lot of funding available for <laughs> Uh, for the electric buses too, we've seen a lot of interest in the electric bus portion of our funding and at least half of the funding has to go towards electric buses. Um, it, they, they, huh, they are useful in rural areas too and they provide other benefits that, you know, they cost much less to actually charge than to buy fuel for. Um, you know, you can, in an emergency, you can use the um, vehicle to grid and have that bus power, you know, the building. And in a lot of rural cases, that building might be where this, the, this, the bus might actually stay overnight at the driver's home, um, where the charger might be located too, you know. And so like that could be something that, you know, there are benefits there. Um, and, and there is a lot more funding for the electric school buses. Um, and I didn't put this chart in my uh, presentation, but for, you know, class seven, an eight bus, you're looking up to $395,000 per bus for the bus and the charger. And for class three to six buses, you're looking at up to $315,000 for the bus and the charger. Uh, and then for the CNG buses, you're looking at $45,000 a bus for class seven and eight, $30,000 for class three to six. And for propane buses, you're looking at $35,000 for seven and eights, and then $30,000 for class three and six. I just want to provide a little balance that this funding can also go towards <laughs> electric buses too. 
But. Oh, absolutely, Tony. And again, we're fuel agnostic here in, in our state. And again, um, you know, today we we're just we were kind of focusing on some of the propane aspects uh, for for this webinar. So, Tony, while I got you on the line, can you talk a little bit? Um, and I don't know if you can talk about this, but so if a school corporation was awarded a grant uh, through, um, uh, say, the uh, the grant process. Um, what would be the process of uh, what they have to do to replace school buses? Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. So um, it depends on the model years of the buses. So if it's 2010 or older, um, you'd be looking at, at, you would have to scrap that bus. So that would involve drilling a hole through the engine block and cutting the, um, the chassis in half. You can sell the stereo, you can sell the seats, you can sell everything else, um, but you would have to you know, get rid of like the, the basic engine and frame of those old buses. If they're 2011s or newer, you can sell, you can donate, or you can scrap the buses. So you have more options with the newer ones. Um, but then for whatever you do, you would have to provide proof of either the destruction, which would mean taking some pictures of the engine bef like before and after you drill the hole and the frame before and after you cut it. Uh, or if you sell the bus, you know, showing the proof of the sale of those buses. Um, and those would be for a grant program, um, that would be submitted along with, you know, your final report. Uh, those those documents would be submitted with that. But for the rebate program, which we're going to see in the fall, um, you know, and this is for any any like if you buy a propane bus or if you buy an electric bus, this is all the same. You know, it's what you do with the old buses. Um, you would be looking at uh, just providing the documentation. And then for all these programs, right now we do believe that the rebates will be the same as last year, and the grant program is the same as the rebates where it's a two-year period so you have you can have the old buses and you get two years to get those new buses because everything is delayed like you know diesel everything is delayed these days so you get two years to get the new bus and then you also have that two-year period before you have to get rid of the old bus so if you've never had an ev or a propane or a cng bus before and it's new to you you can keep that old bus just in case you know for a couple of years to have that transition and then for the grant program on a case-by-case -case basis um they will extend that two-year period to a three-year period um if there's you know extreme delay or if there's some issues with the transitions in fuel or whatnot so um hopefully you know we're trying to make that process whatever it is that folks decide to do um we're trying to make that clean up you know cleaner fueled vehicle process as easy as possible thank you tony um sue uh, a question uh, about uh, with the shortage of drivers has uh, michigan city seen this to be an incentive to attract potentially new school bus drivers um, as, uh, as an opportunity I think it really has helped us keep the drivers we've had. I'm not I'm knock on wood because I don't want to jinx myself. I still have 10 more days left of school. So, but we've we've been able to continue to sustain all of our routes um, for the last since COVID. I mean, have we been short on days? Yes, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, when they see the new things, and I think the media bliss that we have done with propane and seeing that we do care about one, you know clean fuel in the environment, some of the other things that we've done also with safety things, I will say also, I think it's brought people in too. And uh, just like having a job fair and having, we had them come out and drive a propane bus if, if they wanted to um, at the back of our, one of our schools so they could see what it was like to drive a bus. So yeah, I think, I think it has helped us, um, especially with the media blitz we've had anyway with everything with the propane. Uh, thank you. Um, another question, Sue. Um, this is directed towards you. With um, I, I know you had worked with Bluebird and McAllister utilizing the Rouse technology. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the customer service aspects in regards to the training of the mechanics and some of the enhancement that uh, that your your team, uh, their team, brought to Michigan City Schools? Yeah, most definitely. They came here and gave us um, all of us training so that we understood just how the propane functioned um, compared to the gas and the diesel. And we also, as a matter of fact, I'm sending all of my mechanics to um, Roush uh, through McAllister for free training on more uh, training on the propane, especially with the new engines. So they're going in July for that training. Um, they, it's always offered, the majority of that training is free. Um, they will work it out with you. They will tour. You can tour the facilities, whatever you want. If you have questions about anything, especially the safety aspect of it as well, 
um, with the propane because I know that's a big concern with some people. Um, they, they will explain all of it to you and take you through the tour and you can see exactly how everything works and how it's made. Thank you, uh, Sue. And, and then um, another question for you, Kate. Um, I know one of the questions that had come up um, in, in past conversations with, with potential school corporations that were looking at it. Um, can you address um, you know, propane shortages? I, I know several years ago there was uh, the, the talk of propane shortages in, in the United States. And how would you address the potential customer uh, on the use of propane in, uh, in our great state here in Indiana? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's not something that we've seen recently, um, and propane auto gas uh, is very much a growing into, um, industry infrastructure, um, and so the infrastructure is coming up. Um, of course, there can be electric failures as well. Um, there can be power outages, there can be the grid not being able to handle, um, and so we see propane as much more um, reliable than the alternative, uh, including the infrastructure for it. Thank you. Um, and um, Megan, do we have any other questions that have come through? Yes, we do. There's one. Um, are there any provisions to grant writing for small school districts and or private schools, especially in the Envi environmental justice authority communities? I can answer that. Um, again, uh, our goal as uh, Drive Clean Indiana in the Indiana Clean School Bus Consortium is that we will be putting in an application. And if you're interested, uh, please reach out to us because we will be working on this. So our goal is to apply for 100 buses here in the state of Indiana uh, with our team, uh, with our, our team of partnerships throughout the state and you know various folks that are on the call, various folks that aren't on the call. But our goal literally is to be the uh, complete turnkey for our, our great state of Indiana. So that is our goal uh, to do that. So if you have questions on either electric or natural gas or propane, uh, we will address that with you and um, work with uh, some of our partnerships throughout the state of Indiana. Yeah, I just want to add, like what Carl said, like the 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 way that this grant program is set up, um, and and again, it's, this is just one of the two components for the year. There will be the rebate program for six hundred million dollars at least, six hundred million dollars uh, in the fall. Um, so that's where you can get just you know, if you're a school district, you can apply very easily by yourself, but yeah, smaller school districts would want to work with that third party applicant, the eligible third party applicant. Uh, and I think that's the best way to, you know, to get in if you if you have fewer than 15 buses um, that you'd want to bring into your school, uh, but would still want to do something, you know, this spring slash summer for an application, uh, that would be the way to do it, would be through the third party. And again, you're not required um, you, you can put in your own application. As, as Tony had mentioned, um, the, the SAM.gov is really um, a crucial for any federal funding that you'll be applying for. So if you are a school district interested in applying not through uh, Drive Clean Indiana, uh, please make sure that your uh, uh, SAM.gov is up to date because um, everything that is federally related will go through that, whether it's a Department of Education, Department of um, environmental management or department of energy grant department of uh, uh, rural so i mean any of these federal grants that are coming out and you're going to be applying for um you know please make sure that your grants.gov is uh, up to date so um are there any other questions megan yes uh, the application outlines that 95 percent of the funding will go towards electric buses would it not be more feasible to apply for an electric overall overhaul with consideration to the funding preference and the capacity for infrastructure funding as well? So that, okay, the, the, we headquarters is very aware that that the um, the overhaul, I think as you're talking about taking a diesel, it's, a, it's an engine replacement. So basically taking out the guts of the diesel school bus and putting in an electric drivetrain. Um, headquarters is working to get that option in. It's not there now. So for this grant program, you, it is not an option it could be an option come the fall, and it should be an option in a future outlay because what all headquarters is doing right now is, you know, they're working with the universe of companies that do this, and they're working on the um because the other the other aspect of it is if you have too old of a frame, that frame you know could be rusted out from you know, salted roads and stuff like that. So they're just they're working on like what what's the universe of buses that make sense to do this with. And that funding should be it should be an option in the future so it is something that 
headquarters is actively thinking about, but they're just taking their time to get that, you know, what what's available to do that with. They're getting that kind of universe right. And they're just taking, a, a, you know, a little bit of time to do that. And it is, it's a much more cost effective way, um, you know, to electrify a bus than buying a brand new one. Thank you. And the only other question was how to get a copy of the presentation. And the presentation and recording will be posted to our website under the resources tab. I will also send out an email and you can find past uh, recordings from our past sessions on our website as well. Well, again, um, on behalf of uh, the Indiana Clean School Bus Coalition, I just want to thank everyone for being on today's call. Again, if you have any questions, please reach out to us at info at drivecleanindiana.org or call our office. We'd be happy to help you and direct you and answer questions uh, that potentially you have not asked during this webinar. Um, our next um, Indiana Clean School Bus uh, webinar will be on June 13th, um, again at 10 a.m. Central, 11 Eastern, so please plan on attending that. And then next slide, Megan. And so here's some of the upcoming events uh, that are associated with uh, Clean School Bus. Um, I'd also like to uh, direct your attention to our annual conference and expo, which will be taking place in August in Michigan City and our Clean Air Golf Outing. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of our speakers today. I think you guys all did a wonderful job. Uh, so on behalf of the Indiana Clean School Bus Coalition and Drive Clean Indiana, thank you all for attending and we look forward to working with you all. Have a great day. Thanks, Carl.